you know, at a certain point, you just have to own, you know, your unique attributes and, you know, and hopefully flaunt them in a way that gives you that sense of confidence, you know, as opposed to trying to cover stuff to fake other stuff. You're listening to the MILF Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, and everything in between. I'm Jennifer Tracy, your host. I really hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode with Joanne Astro. I know I did. I love her so much. It was so wonderful to have someone on the show who was not in my generation and get that perspective of some history. (laughs) So I want to start doing some more of that and getting more range in that regard. Also, uh, this month's give, January's give, this is the last week of January. So our give this month is for Harvest Home LA, which is an organization in West LA that helps homeless women and children have a place to live. It it offers them shelter and it offers them a foundation and training to build their lives um, and support. And um, it's a beautiful organization. You can find them at harvesthomela.org. I love what they're doing. And for every iTunes review I get, I'm going to give $3. Although I have to tell you guys that last month... I got three iTunes reviews. So obviously I gave more than $9 to every mother counts. I gave a substantial amount more. So it's just really a way to raise awareness. It's not necessarily about my iTunes reviews. I mean, yes, I would like to have iTunes reviews and I really appreciate those of you that have taken the time to write them. But I also know that as people, as humans, as mothers, we're all super busy. And so it's really just this practice of doing this and choosing a different organization every month for me is part of what is important to me. And it's important to my message of being of service and helping other moms and raising the voices of women and mothers to unite and so that we don't feel so alone and to also have a unity of the community of moms all over the world. So different places. I'm not just going to focus on things in Los Angeles, for example, Every Mother Counts that is worldwide. And then next month's uh, organization, which I will uh, unveil next week, is also worldwide. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling. But the point is, I just want to be a voice that raises awareness. It's not about me or, you know, it's kind of just like, hey, if you guys do this thing that's involved in supporting the podcasts, of supporting the voices of women, the stories of the women that come on to my show that may help another woman somewhere in the world, then I'm going to also give this money to this other thing. So it's kind of all in the same vein. I hope that makes sense. And I hope it doesn't sound soapboxy because that's not at all the point. So that's it. So Harvest Home LA, go check them out if you would like, harvesthomela.org. It's really beautiful what they're doing. I wish uh, we could have more of those all over the place. I think what they're doing for young moms, uh, not that you have to be young, (laughs) but most of the women there are young homeless women who have babies or are about to have babies. It provides a service that unfortunately at this time in this country, we don't necessarily offer in many places. There might be one or two places, but... um, We need a lot more of that. So without further ado, this week's guest was such a treat. Oh my gosh. So April Uchitel is a bombshell, first of all. She is so stunningly gorgeous. She answered the door and I kind of lost my breath. She's got this striking red hair. She's tall. Uh, She always wears a red lip, which we talk about in the show. And she has flawless skin and... She's whip smart, whip smart. I mean, just, I was on the edge of my seat the entire time that we had our conversation and I absolutely fell in love with her. (laughs) So I know you guys will too. And um, please enjoy, please enjoy my interview with April. 
Thank you so much for having me in your beautiful home. You are so welcome. And for being on the show. I'm so excited. So I told Catherine, I ask every every mom I'd like to follow who's on the show, you know, to give if she has a recommendation. And she said, oh, I don't know, because she knows so many. Yeah. Amazing group amazing of people. Amazing people, women, men, you know, um, but especially moms. And and she said, Well, give me a list. And so, and you were actually on my list. Oh, really? <laughs> Ah, so yeah, so she just, gave me a thumbs up. She was like, "Well, I can. That's I can do that." And so <laughs> she connected us, and I was super grateful. I had a big fangirl moment. But um, I want to start because I want to know kind of a little bit about your background. Like, where are you from originally? Sure. Um, I was born in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, that's right. And because right. And I went to actually Longmont High School. So you know what those people that say, I was born in New York City, but they were there for two hours and then they moved to Short Hills, New Jersey. <laughs> so I'm always like, okay. Everyone's like, you lived in Boulder? I'm like, I was born in Boulder. Yeah. Um, but then we moved, you know, to a suburb of Denver um, called Lakewood, which is where the whole Columbine thing happened. Yes. Um, and that was after I left. But then Longmont, which is a you know, small suburb outside of Boulder, which has changed tremendously, um, but very, you know, kind of middle class, um, not a lot of diversity, I would say. Um I had one African American woman in the school, and she was the student body president. And yet, there were, I didn't know what Jewish was till I moved to LA. Yeah. So, to give you a sense of kind of the climate and, um, you know, the, those times of kind of isolated and you know, um, a little bit of a bubble that's just very specific yeah. to small towns, you know, in kind of not even Midwest, but um, and really just you know knew that that's not where I wanted to stay. Yeah. And you left after high school? You left I left after high school. I actually went to my freshman year. I went to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. I was going to try and walk on and play volleyball. Did not happen. Um, there's a, once you get against those California girls, forget it. Um, <laughs> and I, it really wasn't the right fit for me in terms of um, the demographic. And I also just really wanted to get out of Colorado so bad. I kind of went anywhere I could get into as opposed to... In retrospect, I should have just stayed in Boulder and then it kind of left later. So then I went back to Boulder and I, you know, I didn't, my parents couldn't afford college. And so I was working and going to school part time. I got a bunch of student loans and um, I went back to Boulder and I was working at the Benetton on oh my Pearl gosh, Street. Yes, and I probably I, went in there when you were there. I'm a really good folder <laughs> and pattern mixer. Um and I thus it began exactly, and you know, but I always had this fashion thing, and I would do retail um, as my part time jobs, you know, before and during high school, and obviously then into college. And I ended up following my best friend, my sister, and my boyfriend at the time, all to um, from Colorado to California. They were all heading to different parts, and so I, funny enough, I. Did not finish at CU and I moved to California to finish and I applied to UCLA and, you know, there was 4,000 applicants for 200 out-of-state spots or something and they said go to Santa Monica City College and then reapply. And then I got to LA and I kind of got into the fashion business and at that point I was making more at 20 than my dad made, you know, and I didn't finish college. And, you know, probably one of my biggest regrets. And, you know, I tried to go online. I was like, I can do this together. And it was really a financial thing for me. I couldn't really afford both. So something I would say, I, you know, for a while, I said it's one of my biggest regrets. Now I don't really look at it that way at all, because it obviously put me on a path. And that was my path. And so um, I let that grudge go. <laughs> yeah. So when you were here, what was your first job in LA? What was your first fashion My job? My first job, I worked in the California Mart and I actually worked for a clothing company called Karen Kane, which is still around. Yes. Um, very, you know, bridge. Um, I had run into a girlfriend one night. So I was, I got here and I was, um, hostessing at Cafe Figaro, um, Everyone was asking, assuming I was going to, you know, I'm an actress slash model slash. And so and when you're hosting, hostessing at a restaurant in West Hollywood, where a lot of people are coming in, it was every day was like, are you a model? Are you an actress? And, you know, I was like, no. And they're like, why are you here? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and I'm like, well, it's, I uh, don't know. And <laughs> the sunshine. Fashion. Yeah. And, you know, fashion, this is in the early 90s. You know, it's really about denim and it has been for a long time. And in those days, it really... 
Esprit was the company I wanted to work at. So yeah. I'm, you know, 20 and there's, there was this amazing Esprit story. Remember on La Cienega and Santa Monica, yes. that gorgeous oh, space. Yeah. yeah. So that was there. And that was the type of brand I wanted to work for. Um, and I, my friend told me about the California Mart and there's this thing called the green sheet, which is like the help wanted. And so she would start to send me them and I would just like look every day for a spree. <laughs> you know? And then she was actually working at Karen Kane and she called me and she's like, you know, we're looking for a receptionist. If you don't want to host us, you know, if you want to try this. And within you know a couple of months I was in sales and with a couple of months I was, you know, kind of quickly taking on more and more and traveling. And, you know, when I didn't get on an airplane until I was 16. So for me, this life of like going to New York, going to San Francisco, doing the shows in Vegas, doing all, you know, all these different marts um, seemed pretty glamorous at, you know, at that time. And so I just kind of jumped in. It was less about the brand or the product for me then. It was really just security. Yeah. You know, and a paycheck. Yeah. And health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> and a 401k. And and also you were probably learning an insane amount. Yes, completely. And at that time, I mean, I this is really going to date me. I remember I was probably a couple weeks working there and the woman who ran the company, um, they just got on a fax machine. Oh. And she's like, <laughs> why, who would ever use this? I can just like, I can just drive it to the factory. I can take the orders over there in my car. Why, why do we have to put the paper through the thing? I'm not kidding, you know? And so, you, you know, things have changed a lot. Yeah. And, you know, being from a small town and kind of like a, not really even understanding the industry, you know, I didn't realize someone sold to the buyers. Like I kind of thought I would go do the Bloomingdale's buying program and get into fashion that way. And then all of a sudden you realize this whole other world exists on the other side. And then, you know, you start to get into the economics of that and, you know, starting to see all the different, you know, connective from the people in production to design to merchandising to, you know, the whole thing. And so it was a great experience and, and it was a very corporate experience. So as much as from a brand perspective, like you had to wear the clothes and I would literally bring extra clothes and I would change in my car. I didn't want anyone to see me in the clothes when I was driving to go meet my friends for drinks. <laughs> you know, it was one of those. Um, so it wasn't really like I work here because it's Prada, you know, um, but it was a really strong foundation, you know, understanding everything from, you know, gross margin analysis to, just, the, you know, how to write an email, you know, and how to like the hierarchy of, you know, how it works in the department stores from, you know, assistants all the way to GMs. And I mean, and that I just have to point out is something you wouldn't have gotten continuing on at CU. You probably wouldn't have even gotten that at FITM. So let's be real. Like you can't replace that real world no. experience. That's so wonderful. No. And, you know, no one has ever asked me about my college yeah, they don't care. No one. No one I mean, I, it clearly says on my resume, attended yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, no one, you know, and it's, it was, again, it was one of these things like you felt like I was kind of not really telling the truth. Um, and then later, you know, when you're looking at resumes and you're looking at education and background and the way I would review someone, I, the first thing I went to is not where do they go to college, you know? And it, because to me, it wasn't a deciding factor for my skill set. Yeah. You know, and, I, as horrible as it sounds, remember when remember when The Apprentice was out and it was like the streets versus the yes. suits or something? Yes. I don't know what it was. Yeah, and something I, like that. And yeah. I just remember like, okay, I guess I'm on the street smart side, yeah. you know, because I can't say Ivy League education. And, yeah. you know, and you look at, you know, there's a million examples of people that have, you know, become incredibly successful with little or no education, yeah. let alone. But it's, you know, it's it's just the way my life played out and well and you had moxie i mean the first thing i thought of was wow you walked on in arizona like i'm gonna walk on and get on the volleyball team let that takes some serious yeah, ovaries so as i say on the show <laughs> you know that's awesome or complete naivete i don't know which one maybe a mix of both <laughs> but like that's you know and then just yeah i'm moving to la and you know a lot of people wouldn't ever do either of those yeah. things i mean when i went back to my 20 year high school reunion. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter, so I didn't have my first child till I was 38. And um, so I was pregnant with my daughter. And I remember I walked in and people were like, oh, we thought you were gay. You're just having your first kid now. You know, they have three kids by now, one in, you know, sure. high school. And then they had an award ceremony and I won the award for went the farthest away. So I'm like from Longmont to Los Angeles. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, and then it was just like, you know, at that point, I was already in New York, but I'm like, wait, no one went to London. No one like how, you know, and, and it was, but that'll give you a sense of the mentality, you know, when I was growing up and 
Um, and I just remember always feeling like just kind of, you know, suffocated by sameness. And, you know, for me, it was the thing growing up was being short, blonde, and voluptuous when I was in high school. Oh, and I God, am like, for me too. none of the above. I hated myself until probably after I graduated. I don't, I kept, I was like, oh, I'm too tall. I'm too tall. I'm too tall. And now it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Why, why? Well, my, my daughter's doing that right now. She's five, seven <sighs> and, you know, 13. And she just confessed that she's been sleeping in the fetal position because she's convinced that she won't grow anymore if she does that. The pediatrician set her straight. And so now she's stretching out Good. in bed because it's not going like, it. to happen. It's not going to change. <laughs> you can't stunt your growth by sleeping in the fetal position. And she'll be so stoked at some yeah. point, as I finally was. But yes. it took me until I was like 20 to I appreciate finally that. just, I don't know what it kid. Yeah, I just, yeah. I think it was an acting teacher. Actually, it was an acting teacher. It was Bill Howie. He was like, stand up straight. What are you yeah. doing? Yeah. Be tall. Yeah. That's That's a... So powerful. It's so powerful and it's an asset and it's what yeah. makes you, you. Yeah. No, I think, you know, just this, that sameness, and I, I see it in my daughter, like this sense of wanting to fit in and wanting to, you know, not stand out too much. And given the fact that I was, you know, this tall, skinny redhead with braces and, you know, didn't really have any physical role models, like people that, you know, everyone says, like, I didn't see anyone who looked like me. And then I saw a old Anne Margaret movie and I was like, okay, there's hope. Yes. I kind of, I could see where, where this could go. She's such a goddess. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was really seeing someone like that to realize, you know, at a certain point, you just have to own, you know, your unique attributes yeah. and, you know, and hopefully flaunt them in a way that gives you that sense of confidence. Yes. You know, as opposed to trying to cover stuff to fake other stuff, oh, you know. Because that's so much work. It's yeah. so exhausting and it doesn't work. It doesn't in work. In fact, has the opposite effect. Yeah. And now, you know, you look back and you just kick yourself for so much yes. wasted insecurity, you know. It so true. It sucks. It's so true. So, okay, so you're out here, Karen Kane, what was the next step for you? So I, you know, I really just kind of climb the ranks there and um, I tend to have a habit of overstaying my welcome. You know, it's like the comfort zone feels like insecurity. And I grew up, my dad was a... Um, he did sales and it was anything from life insurance to oil and gas to real estate. And, you know, it was very commission based and it was like, we had no money. And then we had a paycheck that came and paid all the bills and we still had no money. And, and I swore I would never do sales. And so I actually studied sociology and psychology. Um, and then I, all of a sudden, you know, I'm like the national sales manager. I'm like, shit, how did that happen? <laughs> um, but so the security piece was, was rough for me. And, you know, things weren't moving at the pace that they are now. And so you would wait and you would have your annual review and then you would get a little bit of an increase and you would wait to get the next promotion and fashion specifically, and I'm sure many other industries, but it is so hierarchy driven, you know, and there's this real like pay your dues part of it that is really, you know, detrimental to personal growth. And so people jump around, mm. you know, so, and I was very much of like, you know, stay and work really hard and someone's going to recognize you. And I didn't get the fact that you have to kind of like put your hand up and wave it around and say, you know, I'm doing amazing. Yeah. And funny enough, the founder, Lonnie Kane, you know, one day he called me to his office and he's like, it's time for you to go. You know, it's like, there's really nothing else. You got to, you got to go you do the something nest. else completely. And I was wow. just, and it was, it was literally done in the most fatherly way. Aww, what it a was gift. really, it's funny. Cause I think back and I, I, at the time I was, I felt like he was disowning me in a way, but he was like, you, you got to go. And funny enough, when I got, when I was at spring and later he, he sent me an email and he's like, I'm so proud of you. You know what I mean? It was really, really sweet, but that idea of like you you need more experience, you need different experiences. You can't be 20 years at a company starting at 20 years old. Yeah. Like those days are over. Yeah. You know? And so he did, and I ended up moving to BC going to BCBG. And they um were building a new division and I was kind of supporting a few different things. And um funny if I met Diego and we'd known each other for a couple of years, but we actually had our first date in New York when I was there for work. And the president of BCBG called me and she was like, I hear you got a boyfriend there. You want to move there, you know, kind of thing. And so within a month and a half, Diego and I had our first date and then we moved across country and in together to New York, you know, for wow. this synergistic reason of he had eyes on New York. I, you know, we just kind of held hands and jumped and 
Hmm. So BCBG really, you know, kind of gave me that opportunity. And I just felt like I've already missed my New York window. You know, I'm in my early 30s. Like those, that's when you go and pay your dues there. Like I don't really feel like living like that in New York. And it was great. And, you know, it obviously completely changed course for me too. And I was really kind of bored in LA. You know, I was missing seasons. I was feeling Groundhog Day every day. And when you're in fashion, you're selling six months out. And so right. I'm like, is it August? Is it February? Yeah. You know, it really starts to blur. And then it's five years are gone, you know. So it was ready for a change. And lucky that I found um, someone in the timing just was perfect to kind of take that risk. Felt a little bit you know, less scary. Yeah. Um, and even we both kind of felt like even if we just get ourselves there together and we don't make it together, it was still, you know, worth it. Gonna that. be okay. Yeah. And exactly. yeah, and worth the risk and yeah. worth the experience. Yeah. So but you stayed there for So we did I did nineteen years. And you know, when we when we moved there, we we're like, we'll do New York for five years and we'll come back to LA. And, you know, once you start to put in roots and then obviously build a family, it's it's much different. But for for him, he would have left a lot sooner. He would have left New York a lot sooner. Okay. So I kind of, you know, kept held him hostage. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lived in such a great part of town. Were you always in Tribeca? Yeah, we were in Tri. We were for a minute in Chelsea. Um, when we first landed there, he had an apartment on Fifth and Eleventh. So we started kind of university, and then we started renting in Tribeca, and then we bought in Chelsea in a place upstate, and we kind of did that migration. And we got really actually lucky with a lot of property flipping, you know, at the time. Great. Um, and so we kind of rode that wave and jumped around. And then we did kind of a move into our weekend house um, as a sabbatical for a couple of years. And we tried the upstate life. And, you know, I dragged us back with an opportunity. And at that point, he was just, he when I'm dragging everyone back from the country, he gave me two years Manhattan. And then he's like, then we're out. And mm -hmm. three and a half years later... <laughs> He finally gave me an ultimatum and said, I cannot be here anymore. I'll go anywhere you want, you know, anywhere. I'll go to Boulder. I'll go to Millbrook. I'll go to LA. And so LA really checked the most boxes for both of our industries. And I have a sister here. And so we kind of, we just came back. Yeah. And so full circle. Wow. And you've been back here for a year now, you yeah, said. Yeah, a little, a little over a year. It was a year last July. So. And so when... You had your daughter, your first child. What were you doing work-wise then at that point? So I stayed in fashion for about 25 years and I did um, a chunk of BCBG and then I literally worked at Prada for three weeks and then went back to BCBG. It was definitely a wild month. Um, <laughs> and then I, funny enough, you know, I think... I think we all can kind of manifest to a certain degree. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay, I don't want to be in this company anymore. And there's only two companies I would want to work for. And I literally said it out loud to my husband, I would want to work at Diane von Furstenberg or Marc Jacobs. And I kid you not, the next week I got an email from the president of Diamond Furstenberg and said, you know, I would love to talk to you about an opportunity. That and is my, so amazing. Yeah, it was really, I, love I that. mean, I literally said it to my, I showed it to my husband. He's like, wait, what? You know? Um, and so I did and I went and I went there and I lasted nine years and, you know, this is again, a little overstaying my welcome. I should have got out a year before I actually left. And, um, I don't know what that says about me, but I think what I really realized was that I just was, did not want to be a 50 year old Garmento, you know? And I said that word the other day in the office and people were like, what's a Garmento? Yeah. What is a Garmento? You know? <laughs> let, let, tell us. Um, you know, to me, obviously that the garment business was built on the salesman type mentality and Garmento women, you know, and I'd watched so many in my career are they just women that kind of stay in a certain rut and they get really hardened and they get to a point when they're kind of aging out and it's, it's, they're angry. I'm not, you know, it's like there's, there's just a ceiling and, you know, it's, and it's more apparent now because of the way industry is, is changing so dramatically that, you know, thinking along that hierarchy of just, I'll do this and I'll keep growing up the corporate ladder and then I'll stay for 10 years. Like those days are just over, you know? And so at the same time, really looking at how the industry was changing, how everything was kind of broken, you know, in the model and, having done trade shows and fought with department stores and figured out, um, you know, the competition and fighting to maintain, you know, a certain level of growth. And um, my next step from a career would have been to go be the president of a brand, you know, and I just knew that I did not have a fully fleshed out toolkit, you know, especially as it 
related to digital marketing, what was happening with social media. You know, I mean, Diane is amazing and she, I remember sitting around a table and she's like, we need a blogger. And we're all like, what's a blogger? You know? <laughs> wow. And she's like, oh my God, I'm the oldest person at the table and I'm the one telling you we need a blogger. And she, of course, had Barry Diller and IAC and a lot of tech companies he was investing in. And um, she, you know, I remember we hired this blogger and she, she, I literally remember her sitting, giving us a cheat sheet of like, what is Twitter? What is Tumblr? What is, you know, we're like, okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's again, it's not the fax machine, but it was yeah. another kind of, yeah. you know, evolution, yeah. revolution. And I just thought, okay, that's, that's where it's going. And I am going to be stuck in this like sales strategy, you know, piece that and I, I'm going to lose the opportunity to learn that early where it makes sense and I can build it in as opposed to just having like a high level kind of understanding, but not actually really knowing the nuts and bolts. And for me, being able to kind of lead a team around something I don't quite understand is really hard. And so I decided that, you know, it was time to go and that I needed to figure out how to pivot, you know, and how to pivot in a way that I could take all of those years and that skill set and relationships. Um, and so I started consulting and I started mentoring in the CFDA incubator program, which um, doesn't exist anymore, sadly, but they would take a group of 10 designers and they would give them a break on space. And then they would give them access to 40 mentors in the industry to help them, you know, grow their business. Wow, and that's so what a great program. It was amazing and it also, you know, the vendors benefit too because you're watching these small brands kind of navigate and they're a little bit more nimble. Unfortunately, they don't have a lot of, you know, cash to do a lot of the recommendations and yeah. so it became a trickier situation, frustrating on both sides, right? So, um, but yeah, it was I could kind of keep a foot in with fashion and see how, you know, what was evolving with the seasonality and the department stores and fashion week and whatever. And at the same time, I started to work with some digital boards. Um, one of them was called Bonfair and it was basically um, a moda operandi for accessories and moda acquired them. But it put me on a board with Ava Chen, you know, who's now on Instagram, Eric Katz, who was the founder of Beachman and became one of the co-founders of Spring, um, guys from Richemont. And then I started like, okay, I did been one tunnel, one brand, one team, and I have to just like blow it out laterally. And so I just started meeting with as many people as possible and kind of understanding, you know, this skill set that I have where I really am, you know, nowhere um, and how I could somehow parlay my experience, help somebody, but learn along the way. And so Spring came along as one of our uh, consulting opportunities through ARA, and it just was this perfect moment of like, I'm going to build something from scratch. I'm going to leverage everything I know, and I think we can really create a platform based on all of my knowledge of what's broken in the industry and all of my um, understanding of kind of where I think it's going and create something that I saw it as like the phoenix rising from the ashes of the whole you know industry exploding. And I just... You know, it's just like what what light went off in me of like, this is really where I see this bridge and really painful. Um, you know, I took a massive pay cut. I worked for someone I was 20 years older than. Um, I learned an entirely new language and startup hustle is unlike anything. And, you know, especially when you come from traditional hierarchy fashion where, you know, we kind of left at 630 and we yeah. kind of didn't take it all home all night long. And now I'm working till midnight every night and I, you know, there's not enough time in the day. And, How old are you your know. kids at this point? So Luella was in third grade probably. So, you know, we wow. had moved upstate and so I was coming into the city. We had rented our, our place in Tribeca and we took a little crash pad in Soho and put the kids in school upstate and I was coming back in to do the mentoring and to have some meetings and then I would kind of work remotely. And once we got closer to starting to, you know, launch. So my role was chief brand officer and and I was responsible for kind of managing the brand side and, and really And for our listeners who don't know what Spring is, right. tell sure, me sure, what sorry. Spring is. No, 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 um, please. Spring, I just thought of it. Spring is a marketplace and it started off as a mobile only. So we really saw and this is 2014. So mm -hmm. we saw this app ecosystem happening and you know the idea of every brand was like, do I need to now build an app? Um creating one point of sale that would pretty much aggregate all of these brands e-commerce into one place. So you as a consumer could go and shop from Harry's or Warby or Smashbox or Gucci, 
you know, but unlike when you go shop them at Net-A-Porte or Neiman's, you're getting those buyers edits. Mm. This would bring everything in the catalog because we're integrating directly. Mm. So you can navigate if you want to search for flat black boots, you know, you can get them across the board from everybody. Um, but what was really great was a universal cart. So it was one checkout. Um, we offered free shipping, free returns. And we, it was like basically when we went live, you know, we got a ton of press. We were the number one app in the app store. We had Vogue call us the future of you know, shopping. Huffington Post said we've Uberized fashion, you know, and it was really exciting, you know, to be part yeah. of building something that was so sexy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but it was a lot of banging our heads on the door. And people later, um, there's a company called... Oh my God, I'm totally blanking on it. Orchard Mile. And the founder was like, we couldn't be, we wouldn't be here if Spring didn't do all the, you know, groundbreaking. And, you know, it's, we were kind of that first in and early talking about mobile and early talking about a new platform. So coming from the brand side, I knew all of their pain points and I understood, you know, distribution challenges and I understand those relationship where if you have a brand and you go to sell to a store you lose the power the minute they walk into the showroom, you know, so it's how they merchandise it and then how they display it, you know, how they promote it, how they, if, when they mark it down and every step you lose control, but yet at the end of the day, you're accountable for profitability mm. and that's the fight with the stores. And so being able to take out that middleman, I mean, our, our first blog post was going to be fuck the department store, you know, <laughs> and we are just going to like, we're all, all the brands are going to go do it together, you know, and it was really what I felt. And I really thought, you know, we can do this. And so I threw myself into it and I, you know, I don't think I've ever worked as hard and ever had that kind of fulfilling sense of like, I'm building the future, you wow. know, and it didn't quite pay out like I thought it would, but it was really incredible for me to feel, you know, strong in my convictions of like, I'm changing my role here, you know? And I remember being, I remember went to a, one of the trade shows and I saw all the girls from Bergdorf's and they all kind of looked down their nose at me. Like, they're like, what are you, are you like, you're selling an app? Like, like, ugh, you know? And then like, about six months later, they're like, oh my God, how'd you know how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I really had that. I mean, my first conversations with a lot of people, yeah. I would meet with people, I met with every CEO of Caring and all like from Stella to whatever. And they're all looking at me like, interesting, <laughs> but I'm not sure. But you seem to know what you're talking about. But you know what I mean? And yeah. so I was able, because of my authority and having been on their side, to cut right to the chase of the pain points. And I get pitched stuff all the time. And you can tell when it's a 24 year old kid who's got a script, you know, selling some product or selling a platform. Right. And I was able to kind of cut through that noise very differently. And um, at the same time, because I really honestly believe that this was a win, win, win. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it allowed me to completely learn a new language. I remember we were talking about the product one day and they're talking about the app and I'm talking about the clothes in the app, you know? Yeah. So there's just, you know, all these different nuances yeah. and gazillion acronyms. I would be on conference calls frantically Googling so I know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like, what's SEO? What's, what's, what's CRM? What, you know? And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, they're like, so what's this? I'm like, oh my God. Like I remember standing in front of the mirror and rehearsing so that I didn't, if anybody were to call me out on something, I didn't really have full clarity that I would have enough that I could bullshit my way through. Right. So, you know, it was, it was like going, I felt like I was going to business school. Yeah. You know, and at the same time, I'm taking a bus from upstate New York at 6 a.m., putting on my lipstick in Port Authority wow. and then running down to the Alta Zero showroom or the Alexander Wang showroom or all of Estee Lauder. And then, un, you know, it was just crazy. It was And then crazy coming time. home and having two children and a husband yeah. and having yeah. the, that yeah. piece. Was, was that like your sanctuary? Not, um, not, I mean, you love your work, obviously, yeah. that's evident, but... Just the balancing of that. That's the, a lot. The balancing balance. was hard. And I think, you know, I am so grateful that I have a husband who was really there, you know, and as a photographer, you know, you're freelance, you, you're not going to an office every day. And so he was able when he wasn't shooting to be fully present. And we had... Um, we were basically busing our nanny up from the city and we would high five on the bus. I would literally stick my car keys under the mat and I'd park <laughs> it at the bus station and then she would get off the bus and go get my car and drive to the house. You know, I mean, That's it was awesome. logistically, I, I look back and I was like, we were nuts. And, but that really was about six months of this crazy back and forth. And then it just was uncle, you know, so I had to decide 
I either say, okay, guys, good luck. Thanks. And spring pat me on the back and keep going. Or I, I join. Yeah. And so that's when I dragged the family back to the city and I took a full-time job. I was had still been consulting and then it was even like game really on, you know? So it was a good two years of spring where I probably slept five hours a night, you know, and it how was, was your mental state during it, <laughs> like just you know general. i was i was just so motivated i kind of yeah. and, and and i definitely ignored a, and i still kind of ignore myself which is a whole other conversation but really like the family took a back seat in that moment and i've had you know many conversations with female founders and i wasn't even the founder you know i was on the founding team um but i didn't have that financial responsibility and um you know this i remember crying when i was t- i told the my daughter's teacher upstate that we were going back to the city and I started bursting into tears. And she said, she's like, you know, she's like, you are, you know, the role model of what you're doing. You're showing your family that you're important and that it's worth the whole family moving so that you can have an opportunity. Oh, I just got chills, you know, but it was really tough. Yeah. And luckily I had a husband who was like, Oh, okay, we'll go back. You know, that's so beautiful because just in general, as women, we're not told that, you know, mm-hmm. and I was, that wasn't modeled for me with my mom. Mm-hmm. Everything was about my father's success. Everything was about his schedule, his comfort, his everything. And that was just that generation, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so I, I really admire that. And it, and I can see how it fed you and continues to feed you yeah. just in the way you're talking about it. Your eyes light up yeah. when you talk about it. It's my, a, a girlfriend of mine, Erin, who was the designer at Suno, she had a baby and we talked out after she's on maternity leave and she's like, I go, how was it? She's like, it sucked. She's like, I hate maternity leave, you know? And she's like, she's like, you're like me, you know, when someone does, she's like, you value yourself based on your productivity. Mm. And when she said that, I first was like, oh, I'm like, "Mm." you know, it's true. It's like when there's days you feel really unproductive, you feel less, you know, in some way. And, And maternity leave does tend to give you that sense of, you know, the day was a blur and what did I do? Oh, yeah. Um, And so I think packing, you know, the more busy, the more I feel energized by being busy. Yeah. Um, That said, I do now start to, I'm feeling the repercussions of pushing it for so long and not really checking with myself. And, you know, we moved to LA and I did not, I thought I was done with those startup hours. Um, Not the case. And now this year for me is really like, prioritizing, you know, self-care. Um, but it's really hard. It's so and hard. what does that look like for you? Um, not going to bed at midnight every night. Um, trying to do, you know, a better job with my nutrition. I mean, I literally text Catherine and I'm like, I'm I'm, I'm at Whole Foods. <laughs> do I get the bee pollen or the hemp hearts? <laughs> totally, you know? totally. And she's like, get them both. You know, and but she's, for her, that's so natural because that's what feeds her is do, yeah. being in that world. And and I'm I I have my nutrition is terrible. I ate some carrots on the way over oh here. God, I was so like, I'm so you. hungry. That's a big deal. No, it's serious. I'm I right think that's there with the you. first vegetable I've had. In yeah. Days. yeah, I'm the same. And the problem is I'm teaching my kids that. And so I said, to, you know, I'm trying to do the smoothie challenge and I do a smoothie every morning and my kids just like roll their eyes at me mine too i'm like oh wait Catherine's kids just i know suck that down yeah they chew mushrooms in the kitchen mushrooms in the kitchen and love it and they're so happy i know where am i I going wrong i yeah yeah, i think foundationally i messed up (laughs) there me too me too i'm with you (laughs) so okay so when did violet gray come about so so Ara Katz, who was the co-founder of Spring, and basically funny enough, she brought me Spring and then she eventually brought Violet Gray back into my world. But I had actually known Cassandra, my husband and I had known her way before she became Cassandra Gray and when she was still living in New York. And we'd kept in touch and I'd had her speak on a panel for me at Spring when I did a big event in LA. And when Ara heard I was moving back, she's like, you know, you should just check back in with Cassandra because, you know, they're making some changes. There's been a lot of transition over there. You know, she's got some, you know, really big projects she's working on. And so April of 17, um, I was coming to New York, to LA for business. And so I called her and we had a meeting and, you know, she kind of gave me this big picture of the stuff she wanted to do with the brand. And a lot of it is production. I'm like, I don't do that at all. Like, that's not, you're living in LA. Like there's a gazillion people that, you know, would be way better qualified than me. Um, but she, you know, she knew me enough and my work ethic and, you know, what I had done at spring. And, you know, she, so we started talking and then unfortunately her husband passed away in March. And so we didn't talk for a couple months. Um, I landed here in July and I just kind of took July and August 
to settle the house and the kids. And even though I had that gnawing, like, what am I going to do next? And I, in retrospect, I wish I could have just known those two months were going to be fine on the other end and really enjoyed them. Um, but she rang me back up in July and, you know, and, or in August and said, okay, I'm out of, you know, I'm coming out of the darkness. Um, I'd love to chat again. And so we talked and, you know, I told her my concerns about, you know, what I'd heard about the company and how culture is the most important thing to me. And I've, I've already done this startup thing once. And, um, and she was just really incredibly gracious and was just like, you know, I don't want to be the CEO anymore. Like, I just want to make great art and I want to focus on creative. And, you know, and she, in essence, handed me the keys. Um, and I was just so not at all thinking I'm going to be the CEO of a company as my next step. You know, I thought I'll do some more consulting and maybe I can consult with Violet Gray and I'll work on this particular strategy with you. And, um, you know, sh once I, I, and I actually called a friend of mine who is a CEO of a company and I called him and I said, okay, like I'm kind of terrified. They gave, you know, they basically called me and said, you know, will you be the interim CEO or fundraising? And I said, can I be the CEO? And he goes, he's like, he's like, yes. He's like, it's just chief cheerleader. That's all it is. That's what a CEO does. You're just chief cheerleader. And I was like, I can do that, you know? And he put it in a way that I'm so grateful because he 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 demystified it where I immediately was like, I don't know, you know, I've never really, you know, I've never done fundraising. I've never run a board. I've never like gotten really deep into the PL. You know, I've always had a part of the PL, I've never owned the whole PL. And so I immediately went to like all the stuff I won't like imposter don't have syndrome completely. Like, yeah. And he was just like, you know, and it was really what I needed to hear. And I, then I kind of was like, you know what? I can do anything for six months, you know? And I can't, if I, I can't fuck it up too bad in six months, you know? And I went in with this like, all right, just work really hard for six months and then just see, you know, learn as much as you can. And it's, it's never going to be a negative experience. Um, it's how I sold myself um, to get there. And, you know, once we got in there and I realized, you know, the state of the business and a lot of the work that needed to be done and, you know, I wasn't even going to be able to do the stuff I'm really good at until I can fix a lot of other stuff and just, you know, kind of jumped in and then, you know, of course started connecting to the people and, you know, to the bigger opportunity. And I would, one of my first events I went to, I was probably at the brand for a month and a half and I went to a dinner for that C Magazine hosted and I was put at a table with all these amazing female entrepreneurs and, you know, they're like an April from Violet Gray and literally people were like, oh my God, I love, like I'm Bono. And I'm like, guys, I've only been here for a month. Like I have nothing to do with the brand yet. <laughs> but just seeing that passion for the brand from the people that I think mattered in the way I looked at, you know, LA... Sure. Um, entrepreneurs, founders sure. across people you respected. Yes. That's, and and their yeah. reaction to me just being there, I was like, okay, there is something really special here. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's been only a year, a little over a year. And, you know, we've we've just done a lot of kind of rebuilding foundation stuff so far. But, you know, now this year is it's like the wheels are turning. So um, you know, I'm really excited and it gives me the ability to, I think, hopefully, you know, kind of stop with the 50, 90, 100 hours a week. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really, that's on me. You know, it's, it's, I had drinks with girlfriends about six months after I was here and I was, you know, doing my, how we all bitch about our jobs. And, <laughs> um, and I was like, and then this and then that. And like, well, they should know that you, I'm like, no, no, they is me. <laughs> They're like, well, they should not, they should not make you. I'm like, no, they is me. <laughs> and they're, they're both like, oh my God, that sucks. I'm That's like, That's great. <laughs> and when you realize that you're the they, yes. it was really slightly terrifying. Um, of just the responsibility of, you know, employees and people's livelihoods yeah. and creating an environment that, you know, they're, you want them to be excited to come to and no environment is perfect and nobody knows, you know, what they're doing every day in general, especially when you're building something and, you know, we like to say we're paving the road while we're driving on it, which yeah. some days is exhilarating and other days it's just beyond frustrating. Yeah. And so, you know, having the right team and the right people that are on the same page with you for that, you know, was my first focus um, because I just don't want to have to keep apologizing or justifying, you know, to people that just think we should be in a much different place than we are or should be executing at a much different level than we are at that particular time until they really collectively understand, you know, where we're at and where we're going. And yeah. so um, in that regard, having come from a startup that was run by a 27 year old um, who didn't have any of the experience. And I was like, well, if Alan could be a CEO, I could be a CEO, yeah. you know, this sense of 
I watched him try and figure it out over four years and he had a CEO coach and he, you know, we had 150 employees. Like we got really big, really fast. And a lot of those were in engineering and tech and whatnot. But um, watching how he tried to navigate, you know, every department growing and, and trying to keep communication. And I saw the parts that I saw him really ignoring or really, in my opinion, failing at from a culture perspective or giving lip service to, but not actually doing and so I just continually refer back to the way I felt as an employee in that situation mm. and apply that to the way I act as a leader in that situation as best I can. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you, you really are a chief cheerleader. You yes. know, you have to make sure that everyone's on track and you have the right people owning the right things and, you know, you're able to make decisions, but it's, it's really empowering your team and it's really you know, championing your team in a way and getting them, you know, excited to work on this particular project. Or I know this didn't quite go as we planned. And I know it was incredibly frustrating, but we got this and this, you know, and so it's funny. It it really is a big part of the job. Cheerleader, that makes so much sense. So I want to go back to something you've mentioned a couple of times is um, the importance of culture to you. I want to know more what that means to you and how you're executing it or implementing it or how you see it in the world, in other companies. That's very interesting. You know, I I really go back to saying like I've never had a great culture. And there were parts of times in many, many years at DVF where it was just the funnest time of my life. You know, when we were building and Diane was very involved and, you know, we were literally, she lived in the same space that we worked in. And so she would be on the top floor and she would yell down and she would, you know, (laughs) scream your name across the um, intercom system. And her and Christian Louboutin are best friends. And when Christian was starting out, he would literally come and show the shoes out of our showroom and he would scream up to us and one of us would run down and be the foot model for the Saks appointment, you know? So this is, this is taking it back to that level of, wow. Um, That's history in the making. We were in the West Village before the West Village was, you know, Disneyland like it is now. And this was meatpacking. And so this was literally meat hanging in the streets and um, hogs and heifers, people dancing on the tabletops, amazing places like Florent that's gone. And that was, I was there and that was like 90. It was we got there in 99. Okay, I wasn't there anymore. Yeah. But I, that's, I used to go to yeah. Gosey's down there oh, yeah. when I was modeling there for five seconds. This was still like transvestite hookers yeah. and, you know, a club scene that's a that little sketchy. Yeah. And so we, you know, and, and we all love that. Diane loved that. And so the buyers would come down to the, you know, they it was just not, you're not going to 42nd Street to, you know, go to yeah. the showroom. And so we created a really unique environment and, um, I remember, you know, we would be merchandising the line and we would order in sushi and um, Diane would be coming down and she'd be in her underwear almost all the time. And she was getting ready to go to like the Met Ball and <laughs> she'd get it. dressed while we're like merchandising. Then she'd go out and come back and we would still all be there. And wow. she would be back in her underwear and we would be, you know, laughing. And there was a girl on the team who did an amazing Celine Dion impersonation. <laughs> and, you know, we just we had so much fun. And to me, those were just the best times. And I had talked to Diane not too long ago about those times, you know, she was like, oh, they were just, it was, that was so much fun, you know, pre-recession, you know, before like it got super competitive in the contemporary market and, um, and we were just figuring it out and building it. And then she ran for like CFDA president and we made Diane for president t-shirts and, you know, she came home and we, we just, we had so much fun and that energy of that part of the culture, which I love. And that when I would, you know, think about what I love about it. Um, and it was that camaraderie. And once the company starts to get bigger and, you know, the team start to get a little bit more fragmented and things start to get a little more divisive and then communication breaks down and, you know, I, and I, again, watched it happen, watched it happen at spring. And so it was just really incredibly important to ha- that to me that we had a transparent culture. And, you know, there's definitely things that are not to be shared for many obvious reasons, but for the most part, you know, with ours, with where we went, we were at with the business and what the economics were like. And we had just finished some fundraising and there had been a lot of transition and a lot of energy that I needed to try and shift. And so I just kind of like opened the doors and I made everybody make their calendars public. And I said, you know, my door is open and I set up weekly meetings, staff meetings where it's a, it's not just sitting, everyone saying what we're working on, but an opportunity for teams to ask other teams questions. And I brought the all hands format, you know, from tech um, and I would have teams do presentations. So you could really understand not, not to prove themselves as worthy, but to really let the other teams understand 
you know, the parts that you don't know they're working on and things that they're excited about and skill set that, you know, you didn't know you had to have to be on the digital marketing team or whatever. And opened up dashboard meetings so anybody could come and, you know, listen to the business review. And at the end of the day, like literally started sharing our PL with the whole company, you know. And so something that to me, I'm like, had someone done this for me when I was in my 20s and helped me understand my part to the whole, as opposed to just my ownership of a part. Because to me, that's where the frustration kicks in is when you're looking at another department, get funded or get to hire someone that you weren't allowed to, you know, you, you don't have any money to hire somebody else. But why does that guy have four people, you know? And when you start to look at it from that perspective and, and the whole company understands, you know, we're, we've made this decision because of this. And then I went a step further and I said, okay, we're going to do a company survey and this is anonymous and I want you to be as brutally honest as possible and I'm not going to get offended. You could say you suck as a manager, you know, but I want to just have a baseline, you know, and I want to understand how you're feeling about the company, the culture, your opportunities within it, cross team, this, that, and the other. And, you know, we built out the questions so that I could really try and get the answers. And then there was very open, you know, add whatever else you'd like. Um, and when it, you know, came back in, there wasn't a ton of surprises, but there was this very clear call out of like, you know, are you the boss or is Cassandra the boss? You know, and it really made Cassandra and I sit down and say, okay, collectively, we we operate very differently. We own different pieces. And you know, and we did that in front of the team, you know, and we owned up on certain things that we were not doing well, you know, and we talked about how we're going to work on that. And, you know, to me, it was a way of showing them our, we're still, you know, we're doing the best we can. These are our, situ- you know, the again, everybody looks at the world, has lived in the world differently. And that's what makes a startup incredible because that 24 year old can and should have as much of a say as that 40 year old because they just live in the world. They consume content differently. They approach things differently. And it's not, you know, we don't have one target consumer we're trying to reach and she's 49 and, you know, works at an art gallery, like how you used to look at fashion <laughs> demographics. And so we need to have all these voices at the same time. You obviously can't, you know, have everything be a committee decision. So it's a, it's a juggle. But what I'm really proud of is the fact that, you know, we kind of opened the doors and we had great feedback and we had other people, um, you know, call us out on things we weren't doing great or really just say, I love it here and I'm so excited and I can't wait to see what we do. Or I would like it more if, you know, and so we're, tr- we're really trying to build that into the way we do, you know, even just employee review process, which are also awful and archaic and dreaded. Um, I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do that where it's something you look forward to. You know, you should look forward to that review. You should look forward to that time, you know, of evaluation because it's really where you get to say where you want to go. Yeah. You know, and not expect to get graded. Yeah. 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 Which is just an awful thing. Like, you know, on a scale of one to five. I totally get it now. I get the culture. And I think what an inspiration for other companies and, and other people who might hear this or just even implementing that in your daily life, in your child's school, in your community, in your home, yeah, no, <laughs> your completely. children. I mean, yeah. that's a wonderful model for success yeah. where everyone gets to feel successful right. and heard right. and right. valued and respected. Right. I mean, the worst thing is when something happens, you're like, I had no idea we were doing that. Yeah. I mean, then you feel demoralized. Do you feel purposely left out? Why wasn't I made aware of something that actually does touch my part of the business? And that happens all the time. And many times for nothing other than the fact that you're moving so fast and it's an oversight. And I've definitely done that where I'm like, oh, why didn't I, she should have been in this meeting, you know, and I just messed up. And the first thing I do is like, I'm so sorry. I didn't, you should have been in that meeting, you know, because human nature is to immediately go back and say, what's happening? Am I getting, you know, am I no longer? Sure. Do they no longer care about my opinion? And, you know, those those little slights add up over time. Yeah. And that's, to me, what creates a really negative culture. And yeah. I've lived, I've, I mean, when I was at Spring, I would go spend an hour at a brand and you could feel it walking in. You know, wow. I would walk into some of these really big brands and you want to almost want to chew your arm off to get out of there as fast as you can. You know, it's just, it's heavy and it's yeah. weighted. And, um, you know, if you're going to put, so many hours a week into some place and, you know, leave your kids or your husband or yeah. miss an opportunity, you know, something else. There's, there's that environment is a really big part of it. Yeah. Wow. So, that's amazing. Fine. I have a, a, a question for you that I've been staring at your beautiful red lips <laughs> and I 
cannot seem to find the right, I don't know if it's the right product or if I'm not applying, if it's a user error, (laughs) but every red lipstick I've tried, even liners, they bleed. Yeah. And I really love that look of a strong red lip. So do you have a personal favorite? I I have a few personal favorites and I've asked every brand I talk to, like, can you make the thing that stops the feathering? (laughs) Like, what is that thing? Um, But I love NARS Cruella is my kind of go-to color and they have a great stick and then they also have a liquid version. And I've kind of gotten really now into these liquid versions. MAC has a really good one. Fenty has a really good one with a really cool applicator. Um, but they go on wet and they immediately dry matte. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I literally reapply a couple times a day. And honestly, the way I got into it was because I was running around at spring and I would do five meetings in a day. And, you know, you just you can't walk in looking disheveled. And so you kind of like, you yeah. know, get topped off with a red lip. Um, it's sharp. It and just it has brings to a certain, stay. Yeah. 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 And it's also just my aging process. I've decided that the lips will stay red. The glasses will get bigger. Oh, yeah. I and love it. I was talking to the girls I spent the day with today um, who made a comment on, about the lips. And I said, you know, those women who have had the same look forever. And then you look back and it's like, were they 20? Were they 30? I don't know. when. How old are they? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, the women that like change their hair every month or whatever. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like you, you just you start to really see the aging differently. And yeah. so I'm like, if I'm going to pick a look stick with it from like my mid 40s on like yeah. no one will know when I'm 60. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> I think she just looks the same. Like, here she is with a red lipstick that <laughs> doesn't those, feather. And those glasses. And she's frozen at 42. <laughs> He's frozen it's amazing. Time. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, Linda Rodan, I don't know if you know her, was is really like my aging role model. So she started a company called Rodan Cosmetics. It was his face oil. <gasps> oh yes, of course. And she's this stunning woman um, who just has just crazy style. Like she's, you know, the leather leggings and the combat boots at 70. And, um, and she, and I, when I would meet with her, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to follow whatever you do, you know, because she carries that kind of hip and cool urban uniform with her. Um, and then she does the glasses and the lip thing. I'm like, mm. I'm sold. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm doing that. It works. I mean, you <laughs> opened the front gate and I was like, oh my God, she's so stunning. No, I was like, I'm like, I, they're like, do you wear the lipstick to yoga? I'm like, yes, I do. Yes. Because it's just so fun. All of a sudden you like, you put, and actually what really, when it really started is when I moved upstate and I was afraid about being that woman in my pajamas in my house, dropping my kids off staying in my pajamas and you know and I'm yeah. like I'm putting a lip on it's yeah. gonna be like it's that empowering it makes thing such a difference just the red lip but I've yeah. got to find so I'm gonna try NARS yeah, yeah no, I'll, I'll I'll give you my links okay um because yeah and I don't know if it's just my skin and my lips but everything I've tried it just it just feathers yeah, no. and bleeds well and... the liquid matte ones are great because okay. they really stick for a long time and okay. they're hard to get off you literally gotta scrub them off at that's the end of fine the that's yeah. fine I'm, that's fine I'll just leave it on there <laughs> Until I reapply in the morning. Exactly. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you the three questions I ask of every guest, and then we're going to go into a fun lightning round of questions. What do you think about when you hear the word MILF? I mean, it's funny. Somebody, I was mentoring for a brand called Jonathan Simkai, and I remember somebody told me that the president said she's a MILF, and I was like, I don't know what that is, (laughs) you know? And then I Googled it and I was like, wait, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was recently adduced, introduced to yeah. this in the last five years. Um, yeah. So that's obviously what I think about. Yeah. Uh, and you're talking about our current president. Uh, no, I'm talking about the president of a company that I was mentoring. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I thought not, you meant the president man. of the United States. No. I was like, well, that's probably yeah, a no. daily. No, no, um, no. Okay. No. Got it. The president <laughs> of the company that you were. Yes. Okay. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I would say sleep. I'm changing my mind about sleep. You know, I kind of would hear it. And I'm like, blah, blah. I'll sleep when we're dead. Diane, Diane gets six hours sleep a night. You know, she looks amazing. She's got her ginger tea. She hangs upside down. And, you know, but I, I recently had an acupuncturist explain to me that our bodies detox between 10 p.m. and midnight. And then if I'm not going to bed until midnight every night, I'm depriving my body of that. And he says it leads to inflammation, um, degenerative immune he's like this basically dementia is coming your way and i was like all right okay maybe i'm gonna try and sleep some more <laughs> oh my god put the fear of god into me my yes. god but my vibe like i kind of kick in at 10 o'clock at night you know oh, yeah, and he said it's gonna owl. take a really long time he's like you gotta go to bed at 10 and wake up at five and the idea of that is not appealing in the least and so i'm gonna but i'm, I'm gonna make an effort to like at least shave off a half an hour or add yeah. a half an hour i guess yeah you know just do a little bit yeah 
Good for you. Change. I'm a big, I, I love my sleep, probably a little too much. I need nine <laughs> hours at night. Oh, wow. I know that's crazy, but I just feel so much better. And you get it most nights? I go, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I am in bed most nights by 8.30. Oh, wow. That's and I wake incredible. up at five. See, that's what I should be doing. You're living, you're living the dream. I mean, <laughs> it took me a while to get that regulated, but now I, I do love it. And your kids must go to bed at eight thirty two. Oh yeah, my son yeah. goes to bed at seven thirty. Oh my god, because he's got to get up at the crack of dawn to get the bus to get to right. Encino. Blah, blah. But no, he and he loves sleep too. He needs like eleven hours. Wow, he's he's a good sleeper. It's another thing I'm totally failing at on this end. You know. They like to stay up late too. Yeah. yeah. It's like my daughter goes to bed at 10, my son's at nine, which really means a half an hour after both those things. By the right. time they're really down and out. So, right. But I have to lead by example there too. Yes. Yeah. See, it might change if you lead the pack. Yeah. You're going to be the, the CEO, the cheerleader of sleep. How do you define success? Uh, I think to me, it's, it's a level of fulfillment. You know, I think it's less about monetary or material and title and you know it's it's that sense of accomplishment mm. you know i think success to me is i had a really successful day with my daughter mm. you know i had a really successful like i i went out and i talked to people and i got this feedback and i feel really great about some decisions like that was a success um and i think it has to be in baby steps right if you put success as a long term achievement mm. you know I mean, I, it should like success for me is getting a smoothie and my kid in the morning. No kidding. <laughs> That's a huge <laughs> success. Call me when you get it. <laughs> Call me when you get there. <laughs> okay. Uh, lightning round. Okay. Ocean or desert? I say ocean to look at, but I'm not a really ocean person, but I love the calming sense of that. Yeah. So if I can be up high looking at an ocean, I'm Oh yeah. So you don't psyched. have to get in it. Yeah, totally. so oh no. Ocean. Nobody's getting in it. Not the <laughs> Pacific <laughs> Ocean anyway. Hell no. Uh, favorite junk food? Um, Tootsie Rolls. Oh, yum. Yeah. Movies. When well, now, hold on. We need to just, because Tootsie Rolls, when they're really soft, Mm -hmm. not like hot not like they're melting in mm -hmm. a car but when they're really hard like either they've been really cold or they're stale yeah you can't i gotta throw them out yeah no no they have to be soft for they've sure they've gotta be soft and when you get the fresh. really long one then you pull off the little oh, segmented pieces you so know good. and you get in the you know if you're on a road trip it's yes. like the best thing is it's heaven those huge tootsie rolls yes <laughs> it's like a little project <laughs> totally movies or broadway show movies daytime sex or nighttime sex uh nighttime texting or talking I, you know, texting, it's so sad. I'm like, I, I'm on an emoji communication with my parents now, you know? <laughs> it's like, we're like crazy face, thumbs up, heart, you know? It's it's the shortcut. And I think it's, um, it's very unfortunate. But yeah. don't you kind of freak out when your phone rings? You're like, who's actually calling me? Oh, yeah. Especially you know? if it's an unknown number. I just won't answer it. And it's funny, like someone called me, oh, when I hit my face. <laughs> so, and, um... So I came here and have a huge shiner and I've, I've written about this and it'll post the week that your episode comes up, but I have a huge shiner on my face because I hit my face into the pole and at the class, all the women in the class were so sweet and concerned and we've all been dancing together for years. And so, but one of the women, I didn't know she had my number. She called me twice and my son was standing there in the kitchen and it's, it was like a no number. And I said, oh, I don't, I'm not going to answer it. She called back again a second time. He said, well, mom, it must be important if she called back. Why don't you answer it? And I just thought, oh my God, like wisdom from oh yeah, the no, youth. Really. I have missed nurses, school nurses, because I'm like, oh, it must be spam. I yeah. just ignore it. You know, <laughs> so I, I mean, I've missed some crazy stuff where I'm just like, okay, just answer your phone. Yeah. Um, it, it's really a challenge. And the best is when you're in a meeting and you have your text coming up on your laptop. And so you get the, t and then the voicemail does the text of the voicemail. So it's like someone does leave a message and I get a text on my laptop that says, I'm calling from Wonderland School. And I'm yes. like, ah, I gotta go yes. take that call. Yes. But yeah, it is it is a really unfortunate. My daughter will not pick up the phone and call anybody. You know, I it's know. really My crazy. son, I mean, he doesn't have a phone yet, but he will FaceTime his friends. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's cool. Yeah. He doesn't really text yet because he's nine and a half. Well, yeah. he does text. He'll text me from his email. Yeah. But anyway, it's interesting. I don't know how we're all going to survive this. I know. Cat person or dog person? Um, I am not a pet person at all. Um, dog for sure over cat. And 
Um, we got a dog. We had a dog upstate, which we left back in the country because he had a really awesome life and yeah. acres and best friends. Oh and, yeah. Um, but I remember driving my daughter to school one day, and you know she must have been in second grade. And from the back seat, she's like, "Mom, everybody in the family wants a dog. Dad wants a dog. Sebastian wants a dog. I want a dog. And you're the only one who doesn't want a dog. So basically, you're stealing our joy." <laughs> So from the mouths of babes. So I said, well, I'm, I don't want to be the joy stealer, <laughs> but I'm going to do 5%. I said, so I'll say yes to that dog, but in, in, if it's about to die and no one else is around, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> you I'm guys out. feed it, you yes. scoop the poop. And to the point when they would like, he, Tucker would come jump on my lap and I'd pet him like, well, mom's petting the dog. <laughs> she really likes him. <laughs> you know, I'm like. It was just, it became a real like running joke and my family is vying to get a dog now. So we're, oh boy. Yeah, I'm still 5%. Got it. Smart woman. Um, <clears throat> have you ever worn a unitard? Yes. I think I had a, you know, a nineties aerobic moment. Um, maybe, <laughs> I mean, Jumpsuits a thousand percent. Yeah. Unitard, you know, I think, yeah, I have, a, I think I actually, I did, I was in a Nike commercial as an extra extra in the aerobics studio. Oh, and wow. I think there was some of that happening. Oh, nice. Were there leg warmers? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> I wish we had a picture of that. <laughs> shower or bathtub? Um, shower, oh, you see, this is hard. Love them both for different reasons. And now being in the beauty business, you know, the the rituals I had of products oh, that, yeah. you know, from a great scrub in the shower to an amazing bubble bath, you know. Yeah. So I would have to say I'm pretty 50-50. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, ice cream or chocolate? Um, ice cream. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? I think I could surprise people. I think that, you know, if my, if there was a, if I jumped in, my kids would be like, oh, you don't even know what you're doing. I could definitely... I could impress them. Oh, nice. So that's been a while though. Untold talent. <laughs> if you could push a button, <clears throat> wait, hold on. I want to make sure I ask you the right one. This one is just for you. Mm -hmm. If you could push a button and it would create 10 years of world peace, but it would also place a hundred year ban on all beauty products. <laughs> would you push it? <laughs> oh my God. You have to push the button for peace. <laughs> But um, that would be rough. My lipstick for not two or 10 years. I don't know. I might not push that button. But you still have the glasses. <laughs> That's true. Superpower choice. Invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength? Mm, I think that in LA, ability to fly for sure. Yeah. I mean, don't you ever just like wish you could jump and hover? I mean, the two weeks, I know you guys went out of town, but the two weeks where I'm always in town lately for, because my parents moved close, thankfully. I'm very grateful. I'm in town over the holidays and it's heaven because nobody's here. <laughs> and like you can take Laurel Canyon and get over at nine in the morning in 15 yeah, minutes. No. I mean, it just really points up how, what it, it's just insanity. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So, so fly for sure. Fly. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is <laughs> or a third eye, a literal third eye? Um, I think I'd go for the third eye. Mm-hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. I think a just thinking through the beauty side of that, you know, thinking mm. through the wisdom side of that, mm. you know, and the meditation when you do TM, you know, you basically close your eyes and you think about your third eye. Yeah. And so I think I would go for that. Okay. For sure. I love that. Do you do TM? <laughs> you know, I did it. It, it really saved me in my 20s from a situation that was not going so great. It was just a lot of heartache at once. And um, I ended up getting recommended TM started doing it and it, it really was a life changer. And, you know, but I think like anything, once you feel fixed, you stop doing something. Yeah. And I went to a TM refresher course my mm -hmm. last year in New York with this idea of I'm going to move to LA. It's, I'm just going to take it all down. I'm going to do meditation. I'm going to hike every day. Like literally three minutes outside my front door is the top of the Fryman yeah. Canyon hike. And it's just amazing. You can do yeah. two hours in there. And I have this fantasy of like how my LA life was going to be. And it was going to be l me waking up and doing TM before my hike. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I really, it's, I, it's, I know it's there, yeah. you know. Um, and actually when you do TM, the, you know, you, you basically go through this process, you learn it and then you kind of, you're given your mantra mm. and your mantra is a word that doesn't sound like any other word. Mm. So it doesn't sound like apple, mm. you know, you don't want to have any kind of 
visual connotation when you say your mantra and you're never, ever, ever allowed to say it out loud. So I've never, ever said my mantra out loud. Um, many people have asked, you know, you just, you're not supposed to, you can't. Right. And I have a really hard time keeping secrets. So the fact that I've never <laughs> said my mantra, my mantra out loud is amazing. But when you're in a situation, whether it's stressful or if like you're sitting on a plane, like it's funny, all of a sudden your mantra just comes into your brain oh, and wow. you'll all just start to say it, you know, and breathe and take in. And so I don't do the practice practice and I really should. And I'm sure that would actually help a lot with my sleep situation. I could still do the six hours and do 20 minutes of TM and I would probably benefit from that REM state. Yeah. But it does, it's it's like always there. It comes through. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's in you because yep. you practiced it for so long. Yep. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what was the name of your first pet? Um, Pepe. What was the name of the street you grew up on? You ready? Warren Drive. Pepe so, Warren. Pepe Warren's a good one. Oh, right? that is a good one. <laughs> I love it. You don't know what nationality you are. Uh, you, but. Pepe Warren. <laughs> is that is it a politician or is it a <laughs> I don't know. Right. Uh, April, such a such a pleasure having you. Oh, it was you on super the show. fun. Thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. It was a treat. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with April. Uh, next week on the show, we have Alyssa Goodman, who is the soup cleanse lady, the juice lady, the cancer hack lady. Uh, she's so badass. She's such a MILF. And I loved going to her home and sitting down and having a conversation with her about her life and her journey. And uh, I'm really excited to share that conversation with you next week and also to unveil some exciting things coming out in February in Milfland. I really also want to take a moment to thank my team, my amazing team that helps me put this together. Uh, I always, always want to be very transparent that I do not do this alone. I actually don't do anything alone. <laughs> I have tremendous support and it has taken a lot for me to learn how to ask for help in various areas of my life, but not here. So I have an amazing producer, Sarah Candela is a rock star. Thank you, Sarah. I love you. Derek is our beautiful editor who makes me sound way better on this show than I sound in person. And thank you, Derek, for all that you do. You're amazing. Liz is our right-hand gal, and she does a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And also Kevin, um, our show notes writer, who is brilliant. I really love you guys. I'm so grateful for our team. I'm so grateful to have this platform to help women and to really help all of us feel just a little bit less alone and a little bit less crazy <laughs> because Lord knows we need more of that. And I want to thank my listeners. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for being a part of this. And, you know, as always, I encourage you to reach out, reach out to me, reach out to us. Tell me what you want more of on the show. Tell me something that you like. If you have a guest suggestion, I'm so open to that. My email is actually on my Instagram account. So if you go to MILF Podcast on Instagram, you'll see my email there and you can just click on it and send me, shoot me an email. You can also find me through the website, uh, MILFpodcast.com. If you haven't yet, go ahead and grab your free copy of Seven Habits of Baller Milfs, this little thing I wrote that about all the milfs that I've interviewed and what they have in common. But mostly just thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And I feel so lucky that I get to do this and meet and experience these incredible women week by week. It's, it's such an honor and a privilege. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week until I speak to you next. Bye.